Hello, and welcome to another rendition of Randall Reports. Of course, we're with Randall Carlson here, going to talk about a new sacred geometry course he's going to be teaching in Nashville, Tennessee, coming up in August. And our hosts, Warren Sturry and Ryan Turbeville, are with us tonight, and they're going to take on some conversations, tell us a little bit more about Nashville, uh, some of its history, and the course that's coming coming up. So welcome, gentlemen, and uh, what's going to happen up there? You've taken on uh, host duties, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you, Brad and Randall. Of course, we're uh, extremely excited about this event. It's going to be August 13th and 14th. Uh, that's a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh, we're going to start on Saturday at 7.30 a.m. with registration, and we will have breakfast on site. We'll have uh, a lunch break and dinner on site as well. Mm. Wrap up the wrap up the night around seven thirty, and then start again the next day at eight a.m. Uh, go until about noon. We'll have a lunch, and then we're all going to go over to the Parthenon. Nashville actually has the only full scale replica of the Parthenon in the world. So we're going to spend this uh, entire weekend, uh, over ten hours together, of Randall doing this this incredible workshop on sacred geometry. And we'll learn some of the principles behind the design of the Parthenon. And then we're going to go actually see it together in person. So we're extremely excited about it. I think it's a uh, unique opportunity to really learn, not just in a lecture format, but a true interactive workshop where you're not just hearing a speaker talk about the philosophy of it or history or, and, and all of that will be covered, of course, but, but the, the fun part the, the unique part to me is that you're going to be doing this hands-on workshop where you're, you're physically drawing and Randall's taking you through how to do sacred geometry. Yeah. How so the, you... the, the title actually is the ancient art of design unveiling the science of sacred geometry. So Randall, this is going to be right from the start. So introductory course, uh, if you're, uh, aspiring artist or any any of many disciplines that has an interest uh, this is an excellent course to start with and it is uh, available to show up there in Nashville in person and we're also doing a how-to live stream so if you can't make it to Nashville you are going to be able to watch in real time and then also that will be available uh, later if you can't make it live so yeah. Randall it's uh, yeah right from the beginning yeah let me just for for the sake of clarification, what we're doing uh, this weekend, the, those 10 hours, um, is not the course itself. You could think of it as the pilot episode. It's the, it's the kickoff of the course. Um, and so it, it's going to be mostly introductory material, and it's going to be very much hands-on. It's going to be using the straight edge and the compass. We'll have large uh, drawing pads, and we're providing all of the equipment that everybody needs, uh, including uh, this custom-made Cherrywood compass uh, that everyone will get as part of the tuition. And so we do a lot of drawing and we're going to be um, learning in the classical sense uh, how they may have been doing it uh, back in the time of Plato's Academy. And so um, to get in the mood, of course, not now you guys, are you providing togas for everyone or is that bring your own? <laughs> bring your own toga. Bring your own toga. No, togas are optional, actually, but if you want to get really in the mood. But so, yeah, uh, this leads me to something that, you know, really until I started talking to you guys, I was kind of oblivious to sort of the background on Nashville. And now in the last, whatever, three, four, five months that we've been getting acquainted and I've been learning some things from you guys, I'm becoming, becoming aware of this heritage of Nashville, and it's very intriguing to me. And I want to know more. Nashville has a full-scale replica of the Parthenon is because of this sort of original vision, right? Right. So let's, can we talk about that for a minute? Of course, yeah. When, when Nashville, uh, you know, first went from a, a pioneer town and started developing into a true city, uh, we Somehow, you know, it was kind of organic at first. We, we started to accumulate a lot of universities mm -hmm. and that built uh, upon each other where, where we, the, the men of that time, the leaders of the city 
decided, okay, well, we've got something here. You know, the, the Southern United States at the time, of course, was mostly wilderness. There, there wasn't uh, the great universities that you had in Europe and, and in the Northeast. So Nashville, uh, the, the leaders set out to, to basically make us a beacon of education uh, within the South. And part of doing that, they, they came up with the brand of, of calling Nashville the Athens of the South. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you create a brand like that, it, it kind of snowballs and it ended up uh, becoming where Nashville, in fact, did have more universities than any other city in the South. And I'd say the, the Nashville's, uh, excuse me, the centennial of Tennessee, the 100 year anniversary of the state of Tennessee, they did an expedition, uh, exposition as they used to do back in the day, like these big world's fairs and at this exhibition yeah. we uh we built a replica of the parthenon uh to honor this nickname as the athens of the south and to further promote nashville as this center of learning at that point not just for the south but for the world uh, because the, these expositions were really meant to draw in people from all over the world yeah um, yeah the story so the story the, you, you mentioned the parthenon that's mm. one of my favorite places in nashville is going to Centennial Park, which is maybe five minutes from downtown, and going and sitting in front of this giant Greek temple. Um, it's the only life-size replica in the world. And inside of it is the tallest indoor sculpture in the Western world, which is a 43-and-a-half-foot statue of uh, Athena. It's covered in eight pounds of gold leaf. Um, it's fascinating. But the story, the story behind that building is is really, really fun. I enjoyed learning it. So like Ryan said, in 1896, we host a Centennial Exposition, which is, you know, kind of like the World Fairs that they would do. You know, we, mm -hmm. we essentially <clears throat> constructed, I think it was around 183 buildings out of wood and plaster um, and built this, this massive, uh, you know, festival where everybody came from around the country and probably from around the world to show off uh, their innovations of the day. And it's really incredible to see how ornate some of these buildings were, even though they were just made out of wood and plaster. The, the care for detail that these people put into even a temporary exposition uh, exceeds the care and detail that we put into many permanent structures nowadays. So I think mm -hmm. there's really something to be said about that. So it's funny, so we, we build this Parthenon out of wood and plaster, and there's a, a pyramid sitting next to it. And the Centennial Exposition lasts for six months. And at the end, they say, all right, everybody, time to go home. We're going to start tearing this stuff down. The people of Nashville could not bear to see the Parthenon torn down. So the Parthenon, I believe it was the only structure of this exposition that was left standing. Hmm. It was made to last six months. Well, it sat there for 20 years, made out of wood and plastic. And then in the late 19 uh, teens, I think around 1920, they went and they redid the building with concrete. Mm -hmm. And that's the building that we see today. And then in the late 90s, Alan McGuire, who's uh, his, his studio is actually very close to our lodge here. Um, he constructed the statue of the goddess Athena, which now sits as the centerpiece of that Parthenon. And any anybody who comes to Nashville for this event, or if you are in Nashville, even on a different date, you know, if you come to the event, we're going to be hanging out at the Parthenon with Randall, and it's going to be an incredible experience. But even if you're just traveling through Nashville, the Parthenon, the energy at the Parthenon is 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 purifying and rejuvenating. And there really is something mystical about that place that I think the people who erected that temple, there was an intention there um, that really is kind of showing itself now as, as this city's developed, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, been, I've gotten intrigued about the geography and geology of yeah. of the area the basin that it's in um i i you know one of the things that's intrigued me is for example why cities um emerge from where they do and then you realize that the major cities it it's a confluence the city is an outgrowth of this confluence of of natural conditions that's already there you know chicago is a perfect example if you think about chicago it sits at the south end of lake uh, Michigan, right? <clears throat> so in the 1800s, between the eights, particularly after the Civil War, 
you had the whole timber industry, northern Michigan, northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, with access to the Great Lakes. And so timber could be shipped south through the Great Lakes and south through Michigan, right? Well, it also sat on the edge of the Great Prairie. And so you had the whole agriculture while, while the timber industry is forming to the north, you have agriculture developing, you know, all out, you know, in southern Minnesota, southern Wisconsin, northern Indiana, Illinois, et cetera, Iowa. And so now you had all these farmers with produce, right? So where are they going to bring their beat? What's the central hub to bring their produce? Well, then you also had um, the Chicago River, which feeds into the Illinois River, which ran off the moraine, the southern moraine that forms the natural dam that keeps uh, Lake Michigan from, you know, partially draining away. I mean, there's a, because the glacier lobe came there, there was a major moraine. And just to the south of that moraine, you have, um, you have the Chicago River. And it connects, like I said, with the Illinois. The Illinois ultimately connects to the Mississippi. And so you had this confluence of these natural forces there. So one of the things they did is they cut a canal through the moraine that connected Lake Michigan to, uh, to Chicago River. Now you had a continuous waterway there, right? Then it was a natural stopping off point for the railroads when they're coming. So you had the railroads, you had the shipping, you had the agriculture. Chicago became the natural hub for both the, you know, the gathering of these, uh, you know, of these economic resources and the distribution of them. And it was all because of the pre-existing circumstances that was there. I just cite that as an example. I'm very interested now in looking at Nashville and considering how Nashville emerged out of whatever these prior natural conditions were. And I am absolutely certain that we would look into that and find some very interesting possibilities there. Yeah, but I have a fascinating uh, history. Probably don't have enough time to get into all of it today, but the, the no. Mississippian culture, the mound builder building culture. Yes. Uh, was very prominent in very Tennessee. Very prominent here. Yeah. And, and, and this was, uh, from what we know, Nashville was really a, a spiritual center for them where they would come and, and actually bury their dead. And we, we, as downtown Nashville developed, they uh, had a real problem with, with finding uh, these graveyards. I believe it's some, the estimated, what, 300,000, something like that. Well, that is what uh, William Henry says. Yeah, it's something about uh, estimated 300,000 uh, tombs of sorts underground in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, so it's always been this, this spiritual center. Hmm. And then when uh you know the founders of the modern city started pushing this idea of it being a cultural center uh really centered around classical education uh that's evolved over the years and into today where most people when they think of nashville they think country music music city usa mm -hmm, mm -hmm. nash vegas you know and uh warren and i really uh have the intention to try to get us back to that original idea of being the center of, of learning and cultural overall. Now, music is, a, of course, a huge part of culture, uh, but Nashville has more than country music. We have a, a, a large art scene, music of all sorts, and we still have uh, this large university presence. And I think that what we're doing with this event with you and, and others that we're promoting is is the start of trying to, to uh, expand this this idea and and revive or or resurrect this idea of Nashville again being the Athens of the South and being a cultural leader for the world. Yeah, yeah I, I find event, that tremendously exciting. Yeah, this so this I don't know if I've told you this story. This event has been a long time coming, and you know Ryan and I, I think it was about a year and a half ago, we looked around and we said, man, we've got to do something. We got to we got to do something about this culture here. You know, we have to start chipping away and, and making some sort of an impact. So we started hosting these dinner parties. We would we would have about 20, 20 or so people get together and we would have first we had P.D. Newman. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with P.D. I, Newman. I, I, I know the name. Um, he, I can't uh, think he wrote, of where he, I know it's from. A, he wrote a few books on entheogens and psychedelics. OK, that's um, probably where I. Yeah. So we, yeah. we had him come and speak. He, he came over from Tupelo, Mississippi, and, and we came and had a dinner party and, and 
it was an incredibly enlightening conversation. And we walked away from that event. I guess really the only way I could describe it is like a, a glow. I, I guess I'll speak for myself. I walked away from that event with a glow like I'd never felt before because uh -huh. I, I was able to have a really good time and walk away learning an incredible amount of new information that I felt like set me up for, for personal success and enhancing Nashville. There were no Inthians at, at, at this event. There were the, the, glow, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the glow, glow was just natural. Yeah, the glow, the glow was just natural. Yeah, natural was, high. Uh, so we said, all right, well, let's just keep doing this. So we had William Henry come and speak, and then we had we had Tim Hogan come and speak. Yeah. You're quite familiar with I know Tim. And then we, we've we thrown a couple other events. We did an event, um, personal development event here in Nashville. So we, we've really been investing time and actually, you know, over, over the last two years, Unfortunately, too many of the people of America have been driven indoors, right? Away from yeah. each other. And, you know, social media is great. You can get a lot done, but it's not real. It's a reflection of, of some sort of strange reality. But, but there, there is something about an in-person event and having a conversation with somebody in person that cannot be replaced with any that's, sort of platform. That's corporate. absolutely right. So we said we got to do stuff in person. We got to do yeah. in-person events. Um, so we started throwing these events, these parties, and all of them had some sort of a personal development, enlightenment type of vibe to them. And then we said, uh, you know, we were thinking, what do we want to do next? You know, we got to do some sort of a workshop. And, and Ryan has been a student of your work for longer than I have. I said, we said that we said, who might we know who would know Randall? I called Tim Hogan. I said, this guy's got to know Randall. Called Tim. And Tim said, yeah, let me put you guys in touch. And that's how this whole thing happened. So this... This whole event has been about a year and a half, two years in the making. And I so, cannot be more excited to see what this is like. I really feel like this is going to truly change and completely transform uh, our participants' lives if they choose to pay attention to it. I sure will I'd like to think that. And, and, and it is, you know, it's one of those kinds of things where it, it really, that's why I'm kind of calling it that this is an invitation to enter the Temple of Sacred Geometry. All we're going to be able to do, you know, for a, an initial weekend workshop is just basically open the doors and invite them into what we might want to call the vestibule or the outer court. But there is so, you can go so far with this material in ways that even that our um, ancestors couldn't because of the limitations of the time and the place and the, and the geography. But we are now able to pull together strands of traditions from all over the world that, you know, how were, you know, how are the Vedic cultures using geometry? How are the Incans using geometry? How are the, the mound builders of North America? How are they using geometry? You know, how are, how are the megalithic builders of Northwestern Europe? How are they using geography, geometry? You know, and so we have access to so much now that even previous generations didn't. And I think that what I'm anticipating is over the next generation, we're going to see the emergence of a, a real revival of some very powerful and potent information and knowledge that is really going to help tip the balance of things back towards, well, I'll say what's the whole point underlying uh, the subject of sacred geometry is harmony. That's yeah. ultimately what it's about. It's about harmony and using those principles of geometry to harmonize disparate elements that otherwise might be conflicting or frictional um, yeah. sort of a, this third element where you can, where you can take things that are, would be almost antagonistic elements, but find this common overlap and use that to create this almost mergence or blending in, in the, the old masters, whether they were artists or architects or craftspeople who knew how to employ these principles, they were masters of knowing how to do this. And, this is why when, when, Warren, when you say you go to the, um, you know, Centennial Park, well, <clears throat> that's no accident that you come away with an actual feeling because something is happening there. I would venture to guess that what's actually happening is a confluence of things. One, you've got that structure itself with these, I mean, it's totally based upon the proportions of harmony. And we are in the workshop. We're going to look at that. I'm going to, I always like to use the Parthenon as a really, really uh, beautiful example of how sacred geometry was used to develop the dimensions and proportions of a building. And it's, and it's not only about the geometry, it's also about the geodesy because the proportions of the Parthenon are not 
only uh, uh, an embodiment or a manifestation of these principles of geometric, har geometric harmony, they're also integrated into their very location on the planet. The, the Parthenon is its dimensions and size are determined by its location on the planet. And that to me is a really remarkable thing. And we're going to look at that. We're going to learn about how, the, how that actually is by examining uh, and doing an analysis of, of the Parthenon and looking at its looking at its dimensions, looking at its geometry. And of course, the Parthenon is, is but one example. You see, and, and different cultures had different emphasis. So you might not, you might feel something at the Parthenon. You might feel something that if you go to Stonehenge or Avebury or, or, or Cahokia, you might feel something or, or Emerald Mound in Mississippi. You get a feeling, or you might go to the to Chichen Itza and and to the the uh, some of the the pyramids there, and you get a feeling. Yeah. But it's unique to the place. Yeah. It's unique to the geometry. It's unique to the geography and the place. But it has that resonant that 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 capability of amplifying the resonance that's naturally there already, and I think that was part of the goal is amplification of that natural resonance between the natural environment and the built environment. And of course, ultimately what it's about is that the, and you find this universally all over the ancient world was this, this desire, this, this goal of integrating the terrestrial with the celestial. So these ancient complexes, whether it's a mound complex or, 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 or a, um, you know, an earthwork complex, uh, or, or standing stones, or temples, in some way, it's reflecting the pattern of the heavens. And that was conscious, I think, in the minds of the designers and the builders. So it was not only about the geometry, but it was also about the geography, but not just the terrestrial geography, the celestial geography as well. So there's something very profound that was going on in ancient history that we're only just beginning to fathom. And when you contact me and you tell me that you want Nashville to become like a, a world center of learning. And here it is in my backyard and we're looking perhaps to even relocate to Tennessee. I found that tremendously exciting. Yeah. Well, what you're talking about, Randall, is just so important. You know, if you look at uh, this idea of harmony and beauty and, and you look at how ancient cultures valued these things compared to our modern culture, uh, we're not in a great space. You know, I, I think that if you look at what, what people build reflects what they value. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of our modern structures, uh, quite frankly, they're just kind of soulless, you know, and, and this, uh, we're calling it this uh, art of ancient design or, or science of sacred geometry. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's both. You know, it is it's it an is. art and a science. It is both, absolutely. And, and and we're losing a lot of that. And and I think putting on this workshop, even even just it being this introductory workshop, just getting this knowledge out into the world is so important and could have such a huge cultural impact over time. And and it has the it has this unifying potential. In other words. We can look at geometry of, of the Parthenon, right, uh, as a, a perfect example, which, of course, is, is Greek in nature, right? Or we can look at the, the geometry of, you know, the megalithic works of, of England, and there is connections that, that you can actually develop and see that underlying, for example, there is, you know, the Parthenon's, its facade um, is, uh, is determined by the golden rectangle. In fact, a, 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 golden, per, a, a golden rectangle pretty much perfectly encompasses the facade, the vertical facade of the Parthenon. But you can go to the Great Pyramid of Khufu and you can discover that the golden section, which determines the, the length to width ratio of the golden rectangle, is built into the geometry of the Great Pyramid of Khufu. In other words, if you look at, for example, the if you look at what's called the apothem, which is the from the point of the pyramid to the center of its base, that length compared to the midpoint 
of the square. Think of the pyramid. It's a, on a square base. And if you draw in the diagonals, you're going to get a central point. And if you hang a plumb bob from that central point, then that would give you the apex of the pyramid. And if you were to draw a line from the apex of the pyramid to the center of the base, right, and take that length and the point where the plumb bob drops down and you create that triangle, the hypotenuse of that triangle is to the base of that triangle in the golden section. And it has some very interesting consequences, which results in the sort of a, a quasi solution to the famous problem of squaring the circle. But the point is you go to, to, to Khufu, the pyramid of Khufu, and you find hidden in there, the golden section, you go to the Parthenon, you find hidden in there, the golden section, you can go to Stonehenge. And by golly, you'll find the same thing you can find golden section is there. Now, that can be dismissed by the pseudo skeptics, and they're welcome to do that, because they say oh, you're playing with numbers. And yes, we are playing with numbers. But you know why that's legitimate and valid? It's because our ancestors who built these things and designed these things and conceived of these things, they played with numbers. And so if you want to get into their psychology, if you want to get into their heads, if you want to get into the an understanding of what their motives were and what their methods were and how they went about accomplishing this, you have to get into their heads. To get into their heads, you have to know, yes, they were holding number as some kind of exemplary um, justification for everything they were doing. And they looked at number as sacred. Number wasn't just utilitarian. Oh, we can perform some calculations with number. No, numbers were these sacred things, as were geometric forms. So, you know, let the skeptics go ahead and say, oh, you guys are just playing with numbers to look for these spurious correlations. And I say, yeah, we are. And then, of course, ultimately, it's just like some of the great masters have said, like whether it's Galileo or Johannes Kepler, whoever basically said as much when they said, well, God played with numbers. And that golden and, ratio is throughout our bodies, right? So oh, that's yeah. part of why you're feeling that harmony you're seeing and in the presence of a structure that is built in those same resonant, you know, fractal dimensions and ratios and, and that goes out into the cosmic scale also. So that's why you're feeling some, some attachment, some harmony, some connection, because it's established right in front of you that's also within your body. So that that's in in the city. You says like five miles from downtown. Uh, this full scale example of the Parthenon, right? So that's like a city park uh, that's open to the public, so people can just go in there. I remember Randall and I went probably 2004 or so, and you can walk right up there and get on the stairs. And uh, yeah. I don't believe we went inside at that point, but uh, we were for people. They were, they were having a wedding inside. I do remember. So all I can a, say is they better still be married because them getting uh having their wedding bradley and i were not able to go inside the parthenon yeah. i was thinking that was the second married. time but yeah I, i've i've certainly been wrong before so i'm just thinking if people were going to come into nashville to take the course in person you know if they showed up a day or two early that's a place that they can go you know on their own uh definitely go yeah. sunday uh but if but if people do want to come to the city and check that out that is something they can go right up to Absolutely. 100%. And, you know, what we might even be able to do is, you know, once we have a list of everybody who's coming to Nashville, you know, Ryan and I could probably put together a, a little list of places to see if you come in a few days. There's, there's a few parks actually in Nashville. You know, Bicentennial Mall is also a very interesting, um, you know, geometrically influential place. And, and there's a, a lot of theories behind this park, but it's, it's also a park that is has definitely a very peculiar intentional design to it. Um, mm -hmm. the people speculate, you know, replicates uh, the appearance of a chakra system or Mount Maru from the east. There, there's, there's, there's many places in Nashville that people can go and visit. The Parthenon is one of them. Um, the uh, capital of the state of Tennessee is a, is a Greek revival temple, yeah. in, my, in my opinion. That sits, I, I think it's pretty uh, much acknowledged to be Greek revival. I find yeah. the the tower on it i'm thinking yeah. is that potentially a reference to the great uh one of the seven wonders of the world the lighthouse um i've thought that you it know, certainly I've, does I've, have the appearance of a. you could take that tower from the from the capitol building and set it out on a rock promontory and you almost look like a lighthouse 
Oh, it was it was designed by a, a Freemason named William Strickland, who, who's. Oh, yeah, I've for, heard that name. Yes. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, so I, I would not doubt that there's a lot of uh, thought and, and symbolism put there, and, and it's uh, at the time it, it's it's basically sits on a three tiered mound that is the highest point of the city, uh, and then fairly close to there we have a war memorial. Uh, uh, park and uh, plaza uh, uh -huh. looking for that war memorial plaza has a statue in the middle of it that uh, it's called victory but it looks an awful lot like the god of war mars so uh -huh. you also have this reference to mars hill uh, that's right there in downtown nashville as well yeah so lots lots of cool little links to athens uh the, the original athens and, and now the the athens of the south you know, something you were saying, Randall, uh, got my, my brain churning. You, you, you know, you're talking about how when you go to these places, you walk away with a feeling. Um, when I go to the Parthenon, I walk away with a feeling. And, you know, one of the reasons why Ryan and I wanted to start putting these events together was, well, to impact people, to change Nashville, the culture, which comes down to changing one person at a time. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you experience a feeling like a place like the Parthenon gives you, or Chichen Itza, or I haven't been to the Great Pyramids, but I would imagine that the feeling that you get being there is pretty impactful. When you experience a feeling like that, the, the things that might have made you feel good before that, that might not have been the best things for you, kind of lose their value. You know, the, uh, you know, engaging in, you know, the social media buzz that you get from using that and, you know, gossip whatever it is whatever kind of you know bad habits that you may have that make you feel good when you experience some of these higher and you know what i might call spiritual states of experience of feeling you kind of lose interest in some of those things that might have been bringing you down before yeah. uh so that's that's another thing i think a very practical perspective on on experiences like this is they really do change your mental landscape and the things that you find joyful and things that you find fulfilling in life. And you really get steered towards this more, at least in my personal opinion, a more natural way of living. Uh, it's the same feeling that I get when I go outside and I hike. I would much rather be outside on the trail than be in downtown Nashville dealing with the chaos that is down there. Yeah. Whereas, you know, most of my friends would, uh, would, would beg to differ. So I think that it's, it's, it really is an inner spiritual transformation that takes place when you, start to explore some of these things absolutely and, and absolutely. from what i hear from the, from the inside out from talking to the people of uh, multiple sacred geometry courses and workshop with randall over the the 25 years we've been working together you know people experience that themselves doing these drawings once you get to a certain level you know they're they're seeing it they're producing it themselves and they're connecting to it so they're they're having the same kind of sensation you're describing by by doing these drawings like they're going to do in the course in uh in mid-august coming up here so randall has also produced a video a separate video that we'll definitely link to uh getting more details about what will be covered in the course and then also mm -hmm. another video correct randall about the supplies that you've recommended for the people that uh will be in person are going to be using uh, so they're familiar with them uh, before they even get there, if they don't already have their own, but also the people that want to be involved in their own home and participate in the live stream, they can buy this bundle and have these materials to use themselves during the class. So you've also got a video that, that we're going to link to that, that shows what, what that will include and, and their initial use. So people are awesome. going to have an introduction before they even start. So be ready to hit the ground running, hopefully. Awesome. Yeah, we're, yeah, I've, learned from doing these kinds of workshops that it really helps to get a little bit of standardization going. You know, if everybody comes with their own equipment and their own tools, um, it just makes everything a little bit more complicated, but if everybody's got the same tools and so forth, it, we can, we can fly. And that's what I want to do is because, uh, I don't want to get bogged down in, you know, trying to help, um, you know, for example, on a calculator, you know, you might, I'll, I'll show you just something here very quick and it'll kind of give you the idea. Like here, I've got two kinds of calculators. I've got the TI-36X and 
which is uh, this one, which is the one we use in class, which is very simple because we can get the magic numbers really easy. You know, like if we want to look at um, some of the numbers that are incorporated repetitively <clears throat> into these various structures or the numbers that are iteratively embedded in these various um, uh, geometric forms that we're going to do. Like we look at, for example, if we look at a, um, oh, like a, a dodecahedron, which is a 12-faced a uh, regular polyhedra, and each face is a pentagon. And if you look at each uh, pentagon, pentagonal face, and you look at the confluence or the conjoining of each, av each edge, it's 108 degrees. And because you've got each face is a pentagon, you've got five corners or five vertices, each one has an angle of 108 degrees, a little bit more than 90. So five times 108 is 540, but you got 12 of these. So it gives you 6,480 degrees, right? Now that is a very, very interesting number because that is a number that shows up in a lot of sacred traditions and traditions of ancient geometry, but it's also related to Earth's precessional cycle uh, to a very, very, very precise degree. And so if you look at three signs of the zodiac, the, the time that it takes for the vernal equinox to precess through three signs of the zodiac, it's 6,480 years, plus or minus a decade or two. But it's almost right on the money. And so a full fourfold, when you're talking about the great year, that the great year is an analog for our annual year, which so the, 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 the annual year the diurnal year, which is one day. So this is one of the key principles of sacred geometry is the scale invariant relationships that happen so that there is a relationship between the daily cycle of the earth turning on its axis relative to the sun. And there's a connection, an interesting connection there between that and earth's annual cycle going around the sun, but then a much uh, another linkage to the much grander cycle, which is the procession of the equinoxes, which was the great year of the ancients. And like our annual year, it has four seasons and 12 months. So each season is 6,480 years. And that has this kind of symbolical correlation with the 6,480 degrees that measures the dodecahedron. So one of the things that we do in the class is as we're going through the forms, we're also looking at the numbers. And then we're seeing how those numbers link not only forms in space, but periods within time. And so this canon of numbers that we extract from these studies of, of the forms and the shapes, we then turn around and discover that they also mark these great periodicities that are embedded into the, the uh, tempo of the solar system. And that's what we're actually going with this is we, we, we discover when we go into this that the, the, the harmonic relations that we find in these ancient buildings and structures, which also happens to be the anatomy of our own physical bodies that we inhabit, well, it also governs the proportions and dimensions of the architecture of the solar system itself. And then we learn that only this very precise architecture and, and, its, and its distribution of mass and, and distance and the frequencies of the orbits, all of those are very fine-tuned. And if you start changing that tuning even a little bit, everything goes out of phase, and life as we know it disintegrates into chaos. And so to me, this is a very interesting corollary that when you, when you immerse yourself into the sacred geometry, you're not just studying of great painting and the proportions and dimensions that were used to set up a template or the template that forms the ground plan of, of say a cathedral, right? You're also looking at a template that defines the architecture of the cosmos yeah. and specifically the architecture of our own solar system, which is this highly precisely tuned machine, which if slightly out of tune, we're gone. The whole experiment of biological life on earth ends. So it's, it's, it, there's, there's levels to this that really there's that you just peel back. It starts with simple drawings on paper and looking at the relationship of two perpendicular lines and two parallel lines and going from there. 
And then from there, you generate this whole family of polygons, each with their own unique properties. And then out of those polygons, which are two dimensional, we fold up into the third dimension, and then we begin to develop the polyhedra. And now we have, like Kepler's discovered, that the that how the the uh, ratios of the planetary distances can be defined by the nested platonic, the five nested platonic solids, which you can actually see. I've got some of those models up here, Bip, right up there. But you know that's one of the things that we do. We we make and we sell a whole variety of these platonic solids and semi-regular Archimedean solids. I'll probably bring some of those up just That'd to have be around awesome. because they're interesting to refer to. Now we're not going to get into, in this introductory workshop, we do not get into the, into the three dimensional forms yet into the volumes and things, because you know, there's, there, you, you got to take it. See the problem with learning math is I've discovered almost anybody can learn math, but they have, you have to kind of learn at your own pace. And where people lose it with geometry or studies of math or anything is it, it goes, there's a sequence that happens, you know, like in geometry, we look at, we start with definitions, you know, that's the first thing we, we define our terms. Then we look at axioms. What are the things that we will accept as being true without any further debate? Well, I'll cite one. Uh, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Now in the quantum universe, yes. You could dispute that. At this point, though, we're not going to get into the quantum universe yet. Maybe down further in the, the advanced sacred geometry class, we'll, we'll go quantum. But for now, we're going to stick in our own pretty much neighborhood of time and space. All right. So we don't need to deal with that. And in, in, in our realm of time and space, yes, we're going to accept as axiomatic, questioned, true, true without question, that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So that's an axiom. So you start with the definitions, you go to the axioms, and then from those axioms, you can begin to develop the propositions. And then the propositions are the building blocks that you can then begin to put together and understand. And it's, and, and, you know, it's, I take the approach that, for example, if you, you can learn a lot of this just simply by drawing, you might know how to draw a pentagon and you can, you're very, very good at drawing a pentagon, a five-sided figure, or a, say a nonagon. Um, or a heptagon or an octagon, right? These are the polygons. You can draw these just fine. But now let's say you are a designer. Let's say you're a landscape architect and you want to do a, an octagonal or a pentagonal garden. Now you need to go to the next step. You need to be able to go, okay, well, if I'm going to be, let's say I want my pentagon to be, you know, 60 feet, my garden to be 60 feet, a pentagon, and it's going to be 60 feet, say from, from vertex to vertex, or 60 feet from the uh, center of each edge along the flat, or now how much area is it? I mean, if you're, if you're actually going to work with this, if you're an architect, you're designing a building, you need to know how many square feet are in your, in your building. You know, if you're uh, 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 any kind of a designer, any kind of a craftsperson, you know, I used, I'm going to show it here, my show off my my table back there, you can see that table is an octagon, right? And in there is an eight, an eight pointed uh, compass rose. Yeah, I'm not going to, but, but, but that's what I'm talking. So that is completely an act of geometry. And in order to build the thing, I not only needed to know how to lay out an octagon, I also needed to know how to calculate. Well, let's see. So what I did was I started with an edge length because I thought, okay, if I've got people gathered around the table, and there's eight sides, how much room do I need minimum for a person to sit comfortably so I could have a person at each edge and have eight people around it? Okay, so I think I decided on 22 and a half inches. You know, I sat, I measured some people, and then I used that. So now if you're working from your edge length, now you need to get, be able to have these auxiliary dimensions, like what is your dimension vertex to vertex or flat to flat? in order to lay it all out. Then I had to lay out the compass rows on there. And I used a very specific geometric sequence. The size of the compass rows is not random at all. It's totally related to a sequence of nested squares. Okay, so these are the kind of things that I will teach in the courses. In other words, I take a practical 
you know, the philosophical, the metaphysical, the symbolical, that's all there, but don't even think about getting into the deeper metaphysical ends of it, dimensions of it until you've at least gained some mastery over the basic operations, you see. And then you can begin, because by working with it, you begin to see things, you can begin to perceive relationships. So that's what I'm going to try to do is to make it a practical um, exercise so that somebody can actually go away from this. If you're an artist and you want to do a painting, you go, okay, how could I set up a really cool grid or template upon which I can juxtapose my composition so that the elements of my composition somehow manifest this hidden harmony, right? That's a practical application right there. Or how does the architect use it or the interior designer or a quilter or a stained glass uh, art, artisan person or a, um, a furniture maker? I mean, anybody who works in any kind of or if you're a digital designer, you work in, in digital. And so we won't be getting into that in the workshop, but in the course that's going to follow, there's also going to be a digital element to the, to the instruction. So not only here, drawing with the compass and straight edge, let's say a Pentagon, then if you're working in CAD or one of the digital programs, how do you simply create a Pentagon using that? And because I, I use my architectural software. I mean, that's our business. We have a design build business. So I, you know, I use a CAD program in my architectural design software. And so I'm going to, I'm going to teach that as well. So that's going to also be part of the course. If you're in any, doing any kind of digital design at all. And Randall, um, I know you've shown many times the, the entrance to Plato's Academy, right? And over, over the entrance, it says, let, let, none who are ignorant of geometry enter here uh, that might not be the exact quote but um i think that's that's uh something that's going to be part of your your future school uh that'd be like a requirement that that they learn these basics of the geometry and the construction and you know points beyond there do you guys want to talk a little bit about um you know, where you want to be going with a school and, you know, kind of revamping an educational system, uh, getting more into homeschooler systems. Uh, do you guys want to dig into that a little bit tonight? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, there's going to be venues for getting into that in much greater depth of the, the, you know, to me, the, the, the natural organic outcome of this disseminating this kind of knowledge and application and its ultimate uh, manifestation would be in the form of creating communities, community, creating a school um, where this kind of stuff, because there's so much to this that way beyond what most people would, would imagine in, in a, in a curriculum like this. I mean, there is a PhD program in, in understanding these ancient traditions, you know, the traditions of archaeoastronomy, the traditions of sacred geometry, the, the, the things that these people were doing are amazing. And they've been, not really recognized for how truly amazing they are because it's one thing you can look at, at a Stonehenge and say, yeah, well, this was really an amazing work of engineering and so forth that they were doing here. But the purpose of it was just some, you know, it was a, a, a religious monument for some superstitious religion. And if, if you, if you take that kind of a position or that this was simply used as a tomb or whatever, if you take this position, you can admire you know, the, 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 the amount of work that went into it, you can admire the engineering or, 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 you know, the sheer labor of, you know, cutting and transporting these big stones, but you're missing a whole dimension when you don't understand that there is, that these people weren't just, you know, religious, um, you know, ignorant, pre-scientific, pre-literate people, you know, motivated by superstition, that there was actually method to their madness in this. And when you get into the function of these structures, what, what they, why the motive behind it, that's, if you ignore that and you just dismiss that with, well, this was, you know, obviously a ceremonial center and you leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. There was some kind of a ceremony there. Right. But if you, if, if you do that, then you're missing at least half of the equation. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, talking about the education system, I mean, I think that it, it goes back, you know, farther than we realize. I mean, it's my understanding that essentially the American education system was developed as it is today, 
a little bit over a hundred years ago is essentially an employee factory. Mm -hmm. You know, you had the American, the industrial revolution taking place and they said, well, how are yes. we going to fund, how are we going to, how are we going to support this massive commercial growth? Well, we need to create a system that pumps out employees who won't ask questions. We'll do what we tell them to do. Yeah. And that was factory I workers. Think it, I think it was, I think it was a lot of Carnegie money and Rockefeller money mm -hmm. that created that system. And, and we're now living in the, in the remnants and the continuation of that system, which is not necessarily conducive to helping somebody develop their right. inner gifts, to helping somebody develop mindfulness, to helping somebody develop their creative abilities. Yeah. It's about obedience. It is conformity, yeah, and obedience. And it's no coincidence, you know, talking about sacred geometry, how it's, it's actually very interesting how so many schools look like prisons. Like you actually, <laughs> Like this is yeah. not, I don't, I don't think I'm the only person who noticed this, yeah. but like you go past these, a lot of yeah. schools, elementary schools, they, the architecture of these buildings is actually very similar to correctional facilities. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. You know, yeah. you, you brought up several key ideas there, Randall, of, and, and when you're listing off uh, who, who might uh, could get use out of a workshop like this. Uh, I think obviously you have all the trades that you mentioned there. Uh, I know we have one guy that's actually a software developer who's already bought a ticket because he mm. thinks that this can apply even within writing code, that there may be some application here. But I, I would say that this ultimately is something that everyone could find useful because every human has a part of us, it's my belief, that, that wants to build and wants to create. And while it may not be your trade or may not be your main hobby, that, that there's something innate within all of us that where we are creators. And I think that this, uh, this workshop, maybe for someone who, who doesn't realize they have an interest or a skill in this, that this could awaken that skill or interest just by participating in this. Yeah. Oh, I would agree. And, and, and I mean, it's, to me, it's, it's artistically inspiring but it's also intellectually stimulating. You know, it, it, it really, here's the interesting thing I would say about sacred geometry is that it, that it works with both your left and right hemispheres. You know, it sort of integrates that because to do it, to do it rigorously and, and be able to apply it, like I was saying, you, you can, there are people who know how to draw a Pentagon, right? It's not that hard. There's, you know, four or five steps and you, you could create a Pentagon. But then to be able to actually work with it, like I was pointing out, that's another level of skill. And so I want to give people the, school, the, the, the tools to, to be able to go out and use it. And if it's nothing more than, you know, I could even, and I know that there are some writers that are figuring out that, you know, because when you, when you read a page or you read something written, um, there's a tempo to it right? How you punctuate, how long your sentences are, your paragraph construction, all of that kind of stuff. So this gets into the other, the, 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 the complementary dimension of geometry is, is the, 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 um, the timing of it, you know, the frequencies that you're looking at the, 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 you know, and, and interestingly, think about this, the, even in hidden embedded in the, in the terminology that we use, you know, think about the words, tempo, um, temporal, right, are, are, are words that are describing time and changes in time, right? But they're related to the word and come from the same source as the word temple. Because a temple is, if you think of a, a, a sine wave, and you think of a frequency in a sine wave, and wherever the sine wave, whatever the, the frequency and the, the wavelength of the sine wave is where it crosses zero, there's going to be um, those frequencies are going to create ratios, right? A temple is kind of like taking, a, a, like almost like taking a moving, you know, when you're talking about music, you're talking about rhythm. And, oh, and by the way, the term rhythm comes from the same uh, root as the word arithmetic, right? Because this is, this is part of what's been lost in modern education. I mean, you don't learn when you're learning arithmetic, you're not learning really that embedded within arithmetic is rhythm, right? But, but in geometry, we, we, we explore that dimension of it. 
And we look at that. We look at tempo and tempo and how a tempo is almost like a, a, a freeze frame of a, of a, par, a, a slice of a temporal sequence. You know, if you could just, boom, capture a moment. And then at that moment, there are geometries that are, it's kind of like you fix, you fix that moving um, sine wave in time. And then from there, there's going to be dimensions and proportions. And we're going to see that the, that the, um, that the Parthenon completely conforms to that concept. Again, that relates us back to how it, it's um, unique to its geographic location on Earth. See, if you, if you move to the Parthenon to somewhere else, a different latitude, you need to change the dimensions. So you'll be actually doing a, a little bit of a lecture there on site. And uh, maybe some of those are the, the, the facts, not necessarily secrets, but what you're going to reveal, what, how that relates to where it is on the planet and how it's set out in the measurement. Yeah, I thought I'd do that in the, in the course, in the class. Be part right, of so it. that'll be coming up to uh, August 14th, right? I, I will add in there also template, right? And your yeah, temp tempos and temples, you got a template that's a pattern or a, yeah. you know, a grid that, you know, you're going to follow to be repeated. Mm -hmm. That's right in line there. So, yeah, we're uh, pushing our time here. I know we could get into more things. I, I, I think you guys are going to do a, a separate little discussion on Freemasonry. Uh, and maybe get you right there on site and uh, sit around that beautiful octagonal table in, in Randall's new studio there and uh, get into some of the misperceptions and, uh, you know, the history. And and actually, you know, there, Randall, you mentioned right before we started, they're probably most responsible for maintaining uh, the knowledge and the lineage of the sacred geometry to follow through. Do you want to maybe wrap up on something like that? Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly do. I mean, you know, there are many venues, but the other thing is, is that when you look at the structure of these organizations that have been involved in the perpetuation of this kind of knowledge, um, they all have a Masonic structure to them. They all have a, a system of degrees, uh, a system of initiation, uh, a, sim uh, a system of, you know, progressive revelation of the knowledge, um, oftentimes meeting in the very same kind of a, uh, an environment, you know, with the cardinal directions laid out, um, entering a lodge, you know, from the West, masters in the East. This is, yeah, I mean, these, we find these kinds of correlations all through history all over the world. Um, now, was that, you know, part of, you know, can that be a, a, a verified linkage to modern Freemasonry? Well, probably not, given the kinds of, you know, vagaries of history. Um, but in some cases, I think what we are finding is that, you know, when I came into Freemasonry in the late 70s, you know, the, the, the general consensus was, is that we could trace the origin back to the early 1700s. But then it kind of got pretty spread out and, and, and vague and invisible between, say, there in the Middle Ages. But there's been a lot of scholarship in the interim in the last 40 years, say that to me is really pushing, you know, starting to fill in some pieces showing that I think it's very probable that you had a, an unbroken lineage going back to at least the middle ages. And you had several groups back during that period of time, whose, um, whose, whose particular mysteries formed the basis of the early Masonic lodges. And I think some of those, of course, were the guild, the lodges of, of the, the crap built, uh, the craftsmen, the guild craftsmen that were executing the cathedrals and all, probably also the Templars, because we find, uh, and, and possibly some other uh, influence as well. And I think somebody, some group at that time saw the changing conditions in, in society and the environment that were happening in the late 12, early 1300s, and realized that operative masonry, because look, when we see the flowering of operative masonry in the Middle Ages, it was during a very benign environmental and climatic period on Earth that we now can easily identify as the medieval warm period. It was preceded by the, the, the Dark Ages cold period and followed by the Little Ice Age cold period. And there is, you can see a very definite correlation, temporal correlation between 
the demise of the cathedral building enterprise and the onset of the Little Ice Age and a repeated succession of agricultural failures that led to famine and ultimately pestilence in the form of the bubonic plague and the Black Death, which came on the heels of this environmental change. And so you also see that that was when lodges shifted from being primarily operate, operative lodges to speculative or philosophical lodges, because the grand enterprise that was building 80 of the huge, you know, monuments and maybe 500 lesser abbeys in Europe at that time. I mean, it almost all came to an end within about three or four decades, or certainly within a half a century. I think that was at the time philosophical Freemasonry was created because somebody decided, you know, we have to preserve this legacy in some form. So we will encodify it in this, in the ritual, in the symbols, and we will pass it on until a generation comes along. And once again, the environment is ripe for taking the speculative and making it operational, operative. And I think like just hearing you guys confirms to me what I've known for at least a couple of decades now is that we're on the cusp, I think, of revival of operative Freemasonry. Oh, Guys, really I want to give you a chance to uh, uh, make some closing statements here, but just to reiterate this uh, sacred geometry class, two days, August 13th and 14th in Nashville, Tennessee, and Warren and Ryan there are going to be our hosts for that weekend. And the, uh, the cost of the in-person event will include uh, more than a hundred dollars of the supplies four meals, uh, the, the 10 ish hours of, of coursework, and then also the field trip out to the Parthenon and, and Randall likely speak out there. Hopefully we have a ideal weather. Um, and then the, the remaining will, will go to charities that, that your organization supports there. So that's excellent. Um, and then the live stream is $72. So, uh, we got those choices, uh, go directly to randallcarlson.com. It's right there on the homepage and you can read more details there. And the link will take you right to our how to channel where you can see more of these videos about the event and, uh, make your purchases right there. If you want to join Randall in person or through the live stream, uh, yeah. was that a, that a good summary there, Warren? Oh yeah. yeah. So, so I'm super excited. And, um, I mean, I just think that it's going to be an incredible experience. So you know, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm really, really looking, looking forward, forward to, to it. becoming better acquainted with Nashville. Yeah, we'll show you around. Yeah, thank, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Randall. Of course, you know, we're, we're really excited uh, about this event uh, and about speaking more on the topic of Freemasonry as well. You know, the, we're actually going to be hosting the in-person workshop at our Masonic Lodge. So you'll, you'll get a chance to see uh, what a Masonic temple looks like, uh, and be working, uh, within that. So it'll be a very unique experience. And I think, uh, in all of our opinions, we've, we've talked offline about how we really feel like this is just the beginning, uh, of, of something great here that, that we're going to build. So couldn't be more excited to get started on it. And Me also too. want, wanted to add, uh, you know, it's open to, to minors. We have a, a woman that has been on several of our tours in the Cumberland, uh, plateau area and her daughter has traveled with her and she has fit right in and she wants to be part of this class also. So, uh, if you've got a, you know, a student age person that, uh, you think might be interested, it's okay. Bring them, bring them along. It's open to them too. Now I will also add that, you know, you, you purchased the live stream. $72 is really affordable for what you're going to get. Now you, you got to buy the supply kit separately it's optional, but if you really want to get the full immersive experiential uh, experience, you will go ahead and buy the, the kit. Um, and they're just, you know, on um, uh, Amazon uh, bundle there. I think you can find the link to that. I mean, you guys are working, uh, Warren and Ryan, you guys are working to make sure you have the supplies there for the workshop, the in seats, the in-house workshop. Those yeah. who are live streaming, you'll be able to get the, you know, you'll be able to, there'll be a link you can go and buy. And I think it's like 88 bucks, but the supplies you get, if you decide to go forward after this introductory workshop, you'll already be set up. Um, 
and it's a night we'll, we'll be posting a video in the next day or two where I'll, I'll be showing you all the supplies that you're going to get. Um, so yeah, and, and so look, if you get a, a, a few, if you're a family, if you get, you know, a parent, if you want to do it with your kids, do it, uh, get your kids, just get them the supplies, and then you can do it with your kids. Um, and then for 72 bucks, if you're, you got a, the parents and a couple of kids, you're getting a pretty good deal there. Um, quite quite right. the education for $72. I would Absolutely. say so. And, and the idea, we first were looking at a higher uh, tuition costs, but I thought, okay, this is a kickoff to introduce the, the coursework that we're developing and uh, that would be more extended. Um, and hey, lower the price, you're going to sell more tickets and, and we're going to want, we, we're trying to get the word out. So the money we're raising from this is going to be going to some very interesting stuff, both on Ryan and Warren's end and on our end, um, which of course, you know, if you, if you get engaged with us and what we're doing here, you will be in the loop and you get to see where we're going with it that's right all right well done gentlemen thank you very thank much you. thank you so much excited about seeing you in uh, nashville and taking a look around and uh, meeting the people that want to dig into this course so thanks again uh, we'll see you on the next edition of randall reports see ya